Welcome to this episode of Your Lifestyle is Your Medicine. Today, we are talking to Tim Swackhammer from Mold Medics. He is a mold remediation expert and also a real proponent of a healthy home. So today we're going to talk about the problems with mold, what mold can do to you. And it's strange. It can have some weird and wacky symptoms that can't be explained by normal medical tests. But also, if you do find mold in your house, what you can do about it and what kind of checks that you can do to make sure that mold does not become a problem in your home. And also, towards the end of this interview, he drops a bombshell about radon gas, which just really wasn't on my radar at all. So listen towards the end to find out what he talks about there. And I hope you enjoy this episode. Tim, welcome to the show. Awesome. Thank you very much for having me on. I think it's going to be a great talk. It is. I'm so excited about this because mold is one of those things that uh, we've all kind of seen it and yet none of us really understand what it is. But I just want to um, preface this talk by something that one of my uh, mentors and a previous podcast host has said about mold, and that's Dr. Terry Walls. And she talks about how mold in your home can uh, make people experience chronic fatigue, cognitive and mood disorders, as well as affect their hormones. So in, in women, that can uh, be PMS, infertility, early menopause, sexual dysfunction, but night sweats in both men and women, and thyroid dysfunction, and a whole host of other disorders. And, and that seems to me like pretty extreme. So I want to dissect that a little bit with you and, and see what your take is it on it is as being a mold expert. So can we just dive straight into the health problems of mold, and then we'll get into what mold looks like and all that kind of stuff? Sure, absolutely. So whenever we're talking about sort of the health implications of mold, there's kind of two different camps. There's at first the uh, the very widely accepted, uh, recognized in all modern medicine, health implications of mold. This is uh, mostly respiratory issues. So okay. uh, having mold exposure in your lungs, causing breathing problems, wheezing, coughing, uh, sore throat, extra mucus, all those kind of sort of standard respiratory problems that you would expect uh, from mold or other other issues with your breathing. Uh, then we get into a whole nother space that's really, really just starting to, there's just starting to be a lot more science on it. There's starting to be a lot more doctors, especially in the functional medicine uh, right. field that are recognizing a lot more of the issues like what you mentioned uh, that can be impacting people's health. And uh, trying to go back through in my mind, the list that you just ran through and <laughs> I would say at least 90% of those um, are issues that clients of ours have presented with and have been experiencing. I yeah. mean, it's, it is stuff that we see pretty commonly. We've really focused a lot of our work on uh, clients who are suffering from long-term exposure to mold issues uh, and to other indoor allergens. And, and they've presented with a lot of these type of problems. I mean, especially the chronic inflammatory response syndrome, uh, the general brain fog, the complete uh, just lack of energy, mm, uh, so can... all very, very, yeah, the chronic fatigue, it's all very common with uh, the clients that we're working with. Okay. Well, I want to take it back a little bit and we'll get into, you know, what is what is the mold? Well, let's say you can start with what is mold and how does it get into your lungs? And is that the only way it gets into your body? So tell me like, you know, in my home, what, what would I experience as mold and, and how would it affect me? Or how does does it affect? Yeah, me? yeah. So first, uh, I like to always just go into a little bit of a more background side of mold. Uh, mold exists everywhere in nature. It's mm. in everywhere outside. It's in every bit of air that you breathe. Uh, there's di all different types of mold. There's thousands of different species uh, that all serve slightly different purposes and are more common in certain areas than others. Uh, but really, at its core, the purpose of mold is to break down dead plant material. And so in a normal outdoor environment, uh, the reason whenever you walk around outside after uh, winter and don't see just piles and piles of dead leaves everywhere is mold is there, it's breaking that material down. Uh, so it's not just constantly piling up. So it is something that is necessary uh, for our ecosystem. Yeah. Uh, where things get concerning is we also build our houses, not exclusively, but primarily out of dead plant material. I mean, every bit of wood is a food source for mold. Every bit of drywall has a paper backing to it. Uh, that can be a source for mold. A lot of the adhesives have various plant materials that can all be 
great sources of uh, food for mold. So if we aren't in great control of our indoor environments, we can end up where instead of mold feeding on the dead plant material outside our homes, now it's feeding on the plant material inside our homes, colonizing and trying to spread. And that's the, the primary way that uh, it impacts our health is through breathing it in because you have active colonization in your home. Whenever it's spreading, it's producing spores. You breathe that in and that can begin to cause damage. And uh, particularly whenever we're talking about environmental issues, it's almost always exposure over time that we're concerned right. about. So like a it's lot of that, exposure, like if you just go into the woods and sort of plant the leaves, that's fine. But if yep, it's in your you've bedroom got, or something. Yeah. And, and in an outside environment, you've got plenty of fresh air. Everything's moving around. Whereas whenever you have it in an indoor environment, uh, the levels can get extremely high pretty easily, depending on what's going on. And you're trapped in that space for a long period of time. You're sleeping there. You're not, it's not just a, a transit transient experience. It's something that you're experiencing for hours per day, days, weeks, months, years on end. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And what, so out of all those different um, types of mold, what is the main one that, that you see in people's houses? Is there one or is it many? So there's one and it's not, a, it's not the main one that we see, it's, but it's the main one that gets the most uh, screen time. Uh, toxic black mold, stachybotrys uh, is the actual species for it. But this is what most people are aware of whenever they think about mold and health implications. Mm -hmm. And it's a uh, thicker, dark colored, sticky mold that comes from longer term, heavy water exposure. Right. So this is a type of mold that's going to be presenting after you've had uh, significant water intrusion issues that have been going on untreated for uh, typically an extended period of time, at least weeks generally. Um, in many cases, we see things that have been untreated for years, uh, in which case the issues can get much, much, much more spread from there. Um, but it's not something that's going to appear just overnight because uh, somebody spilt some water on the floor and then, oh my God, you've got it growing out of your wood floor. It's, it does take pretty significant time. Uh, but that definitely gets the most uh, screen time. It's the the kind of scariest. The media generally, whenever they pick up a story about mold, it's labeled toxic black mold all mm -hmm. over it. Um, and it definitely gets the the most awareness. But it's really not the most common. Whenever we talk about common issues, uh, molds in the aspergillus, aspergillus and penicillium families, uh, which in our experience tend to be more uh, closely related to humidity problems rather than full on water intrusion issues. Mm -hmm. uh, they tend to be a bit more common and we see those pretty frequently and they can cause a lot of uh, similar health effects. Okay. Interesting. Cause you kind of think of penicillin being good for us, but I guess in the mold form, it's not so good for us. And there's just, yeah. I mean, there's so many different families and uh, variants that we really, whenever we're talking about uh, mold from a remediation perspective, it's narrowing down to basically the different identifiable families based on our testing methods that mm -hmm. are available. Well, if I was to walk into my bar, so I'm from, from the UK originally, and the UK I think has this chronic mold problem. Every old house, you go into the bathroom and the silicone around the bath has these black dots in it, and maybe the ceiling has black patches on it. What, what? I mean, I might be hard for you to answer, but what type of mold is that? Is that black uh, it, it's, it is really honestly hard to say without actually testing it and confirming. Um, I wouldn't expect like stacky botches unless it's, been that way for a long period of time and right. gone unaddressed. Yeah. Okay. So it's more likely to be one of the other ones that, that still affects us, but it's not could not so poisonous. Yeah. And that's one of the, the really challenging things whenever we're talking about mold and its health effects is everybody is different in the way that they react. Mm -hmm. Some people are a lot more sensitive to others. There's been some links about sort of chronic exposure, increasing one's sensitivity. Uh, so if you're in a home that if you grew up in a home with significant mold issues, mm -hmm. uh, you're likely to be a lot more sensitive to it as you age. Um, but there's just, I mean, like a lot of things, there's a wide level of variability between different individuals, even family members, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of how they're impacted by these things. So it's uh, mm -hmm. challenging to draw back, okay, this level of exposure equals yes. this health effect. Yeah, yeah I do I do remember uh, talking to some functional medicine doctors about this and they were talking about, you've got a, sometimes a genetic predisposition, then the length of exposure, then chronic illness, um, synthetic hormone use can affect it, uh, any sort of concussion or brain injury, and then 
strange enough, adverse childhood events, so some sort of trauma in your childhood can make you more susceptible to mold exposure. This is what I, what I, what I heard anyway, uh, later on in life. So I understand what you're saying. It's going to be difficult to say this dose equals this problem. Um, interesting. Yeah, and that's that's an interesting one. I have I'm not overly familiar with, but I'll I'll definitely be looking up because that's uh, yeah. I always I'm a researcher by heart. So right. the more that I can learn, the more information I can find, uh, and as much of it as we can that we can implement into our practice. Yeah. We really really try to do that. So so when your uh, your company is coming into a person's home to remediate the mold. What is the sort of the, the genesis of that? Is it a health issue that makes them call you? Is it a functional medicine doctor link up or is it an insurance sort of flooding issue? Tell me about that. A little bit of everything. So we really don't deal much on the insurance sort of flood side. Um, there's company, there's large insurance contractors uh, or large restoration contractors that do their entire business is working for the insurance companies. When somebody has a big water loss, they have a fire, they have a flood, that kind of thing. Um, we're really a little bit different. We're focused more on the property and the individuals in the property. Uh, and a lot of our issues are more uh, caused by long-term either neglect of the building, improper building maintenance, uh, or just uh, unfortunately, a lot of times improper building science. Uh, people that there's some things that we've done over the years that we thought were a really good idea from an energy efficiency standpoint that nice. it turns out can create all kinds of different problems like, like what? over the long term. Like what? Um, one of the most common ones uh, is vapor barriers inside walls. So this is basically putting plastic sheeting inside a wall cavity yeah. uh, to control vapor movement. Right. And they can work in some climates, but not in others. So okay. whenever you take the same practice that works, say, in the, uh, the south of the U.S., where they don't really have any heating season. So there's no time where they're running uh, uh, any sort of furnace for heat in their home. Yeah, that, that heat differential isn't there between the inside and the outside of the house. Yeah. Yep. Uh, but then they've got a long cooling season where they're running their air conditioning throughout right. the course of the summer. Uh, a vapor barrier can work there, but it's got to be positioned correctly in the wall relative to uh, the outer envelope, the interior envelope and the insulation. Uh, and then you go to extreme north climates where it's the reverse. A vapor mm -hmm. barrier can work there as well. But again, it's got to be positioned correctly so that you're controlling uh, the way that the vapor's moving yes, through the walls. Yes, I can see that. So it's got to be the other side of the ins insulation or something. Correct. Yeah, so then you get into areas like where we are. We're in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where we have almost exactly half and half. We right. have uh, pretty decent fall, pretty decent spring, but then we've got Summers that can be very hot with lots of air conditioning use. Winters that can be very cold, lots of heating use. Uh, and putting a vapor barrier in the wall is just a terrible idea because you're going to be wrong half the year. And you get a particularly dry winter, a particularly wet summer, depending on where that vapor barrier is. And now you can end up with a mold problem kind of throughout the walls. Hmm. Uh, and that was just something that was poor building science. Hmm. Yeah, okay. All right, so so someone can contacts you from any any number of different sort of sources. And then what happens? You go into the home and you mentioned testing. Is that the first thing you do or what was the first thing you do? Yeah. So it really depends on why we're being contacted and what the issue is that that's bringing us in there. Um, we do always recommend testing because testing can help to determine what types of mold are present and the uh, total scope of the issue, how widespread it is throughout the home, whether it's uh, relatively isolated to certain areas or if there's something uh, where it is more airborne and uh, present in more of the living space. Mm. Uh, so testing can definitely be a very good tool there. Uh, but a lot of the inspection comes down to a thorough vis visual inspection. And I always tell my guys, if I could have only one tool to do mold inspections, it would be a flashlight right. because that's going to give us the most information out of any, any of the tools that we have. Uh, but then there's additional diagnostics uh, that we use as well, of course, uh, moisture meters, uh, hydrometers to measure the humidity, uh, the moisture meters measure the moisture content of various building materials, thermal imaging cameras that can tell us about uh, if there's mold or if there's water hidden in certain areas that we can't visually see or access with a moisture meter, um, air particle counters that can help give us uh, insight on the particulate matter in the air. So there's so a variety of different can test the diagnostics. Air. You can test the air and does it test for the spores? So we can do a couple different types of testing. So a... Uh, 
A particle counter literally just counts the levels of particulate in the air. So it doesn't necessarily say it's mold particulate, but it right. can give us a good insight as to how much particulate in the, is in the air uh, across the board. We can do testing for spores specifically, uh, and that would be a mold air test where basically we use a pump. It's set for a controlled time. It pulls air across a, uh, a canister that has a slide inside it. Mold spores get trapped on the slide. We compare those samples from the inside of the home to the outside of the home to know, okay, what are the levels looking like on the inside air versus the outside? Because that will tell us basically if the issue is coming from inside the home or if it's uh, problems that are common on the outside or levels that are common on the outside. And we're just looking for a good comparison there. Interesting. Okay, so you go into a home, you, you do the tests, and maybe you find something, then what? Yep. So then it's really going to come down to uh, the actual remediation process. I mean, we'll obviously talk it through with the customer, figure out uh, what they've been experiencing, what their goals are. That that whole consultation process is something that we're very, very big on because we want to want to make sure that our goals are in line with the client's goals. And just because there's certain industri industry standards that we're trying to meet with all services, but really that's kind of the bare minimum. And there's some clients that do need more based on their individual sensitivities. So we want to make sure we really understand what they're experiencing, what they're going through, have a good scope mm -hmm. of the issues that are present in the home. Uh, and then we put together a remediation plan. And that's going to vary greatly situation by situation. Uh, but at the end of the day, the it really breaks down into a few key parts. The first is containment. So isolating off whatever areas we're working in, uh, for the remediation process for, uh, from the other areas of the home. So making sure we've got doorways, windows, uh, air uh, supplies and returns, basically anywhere that air movement could occur, we've got those completely isolated and sectioned off so we're not spreading issues yeah. from certain areas to others. Uh, setting up mechanical controls like air scrubbers or negative air pressure to actually clean the air as we're going through the remediation process, make sure that we're removing any airborne particulate from the air. Uh, then we go through and do whatever building material removal is necessary. So a lot of times it's going to be drywall, it's going to be carpeting, flooring, trim, those kind of things, mm -hmm. uh, insulation that will remove, follow proper protocols so that, again, we're not contaminating any other areas of the house during that process. Um, and once it's all completely stripped down, then we go through and it's basically a uh, detail cleaning to remove any lingering dust, mold spores, anything that could be left in the environment after we've done the removal. Uh, and that's done with a variety of different wipe down processes, HEPA vacuums, uh, and some other tools that we have our, at our disposal to mm. make sure that we're leaving the environment as clean as it can possibly be. Uh, and then once that's all done, um, uh, we do go through and treat everything with a, uh, as safe of it as a disinfectant as we can, just to make sure that anything that could be lingering or a lot of times with a, with a mold issue, it comes from water damage, which can lead to bacterial and viral growth and things like that as well. So we want to make sure we're treating for uh, those as well. So we'll go through and do the disinfectant application. And then it's basically uh, post-testing verification. So having a third party come in and test the environment to make oh, sure that that's nice. It like is yeah. good and clean and we accomplished our job. Uh, and then basically it's to the client to, uh, we don't do the rebuild ourselves where I'm, we don't hire drywallers, we hire environmental uh, technicians. So right. we're not going to do the drywall replacement or that kind of stuff, but uh, we'll help the client work with a general contractor or whatever spe specialty trade they need to come in and get their home back into a uh, livable condition. Okay. So what, what would you say to people who, because I was thinking as you talked there, people who feel like there should be more dirt in our environment, that we've gone too clean and, you know, that there's, there's a thing called the speck of, speck of dirt hypothesis that a lot of our immune problems, autoimmune problems are coming because it's too clean. Is that a, is that a valid argument in this case or, or not? I think it's a valid argument and I'm a huge proponent of that uh, in certain situations. I mean, I've got three children. I want them playing outside as yeah. much as possible. I want them getting dirty. I want them getting exposed to everything that's in the environment. Um, 
I don't think it really applies to mold remediation specifically uh, or these type of environmental issues that we're talking about because it's not, we're not talking about just a spec. Yeah. These are problems that uh, if not treated and if not addressed can grow very rapidly and can become uh, very widespread. And we don't want that to happen. We don't. And again, it's that exposure over time. It's not something where they're going outside and they're being exposed to a few spores of something. They're trapped in that environment, being exposed to high levels over a long period of time. And that's really what we want to address. Yeah, I think, I, you know, the way you answered that, I think is it agrees with my sort of thought on it, that uh, as with anything, too much of it is a bad thing. A little bit of it's probably okay. It keeps our immune system working and active. Um, but the clients who've had the long-term exposure, leaving it in their house in any way is probably not going to be good for you. Um, yeah. Interesting. What about houseplants? Um, I've, I've heard about that people overwater houseplants and inadvertently mm -hmm. can cause mold that way. Is that true? Yeah, so houseplants can be problematic for a couple of reasons. So uh, first, they can be good because obviously houseplants can help to actually clean the air. Um, and it's definitely good from that perspective. From a remediation perspective, they can be problematic really for two reasons. Uh, first, they can really throw off a lot of the testing that's done uh, we'll because yeah. particularly the, the mulch um, that is commonly in houseplants, right. uh, mulch has can have very high contents of mold because it's literally decaying plant material. So uh, mulch can be very problematic and that can really throw off the testing. Uh, and then, yeah, the second point of overwatering, uh, particularly whenever it begins to leach out of whatever pot the uh, yeah. the plant is in, that can be very problematic because a lot of people will have house plants that typically they're put in a corner. They're not somewhere that's like super visible all around it. Uh, they're up, so if you have a, like a larger house plant that's in a pot on the floor in the corner of a room and it's been overwatered, sometimes those don't get cleaned, around, cleaned out or no. cleaned around as frequently as they should. Mm -hmm. And then you go to move it and now you've got a problem that you visually identify behind the house plant because it's been overwatered. So yeah. um, they can be perfectly fine, but it's definitely something you just want to be mindful of. And it's uh, unfortunately a lot of the things, and whenever we're talking about environmental uh health in our homes, a lot of this is a trade-off and it's just about making informed choices based on your environment. I mean, the, and your individual risk factors. Uh, houseplants are one of those, pets are another one. Um, I'm a big pet lover, I love dogs, but they do bring in a lot of additional uh, mold and dirt and mud and everything like that from the outside. They produce a ton of pet dander, which can be an allergen for a lot of people. Um, and even if it's not particularly an allergen, it can diminish your air quality because you're adding additional particulate into your air quality. Uh, and they can also, whenever they urinate, and particularly cats on this one, urinate on surfaces. Uh, it's We've seen a lot of issues that are caused by, they'll find a favorite spot in the corner yeah. and it's somewhere kind of hidden. People don't really know that it's there and you've got an issue over time. Tell me about it. I have well, had two cats, and uh, yeah, they took they took a liking to uh, this little rug upstairs. But we've got a dog, a whole bunch. Of, actually, we have we have bats as well. And and uh, oh, we had wow. a construction crew in recently because there was a bit of flooding, and it came through in the kitchen, and they cut it out. And I popped my head up there, and I look. There's this cavity, and it had like an inch thick of of. Um, What's it called? Uh, gu guillaume? Anyway, the, uh, the, the guano. Guano. No, yeah, it guano? was the, yeah, yeah, guano for like for like literally twenty feet across. Oh and, geez. Uh, yeah. I, I rent I rent this house and I and I said to the landlord, I'm like, you know, sorry to tell you this, but you got to take out this whole um this whole ceiling, and so yeah. the construction crew came in and they just cleaned it all up. But yeah, it's disgusting. Yeah. So so I mean, a lot of that's it's it's all about trade offs. I mean, it's the same thing we see. Uh, it, one of the worst building or uh, flooring materials you can have in your home for indoor air quality is carpeting. Yeah. Because uh, it just traps everything. It's very difficult to fully clean, uh, but it's more comfortable. Mm -hmm. So there's yeah. just kind of that trade off there, depending on your individual risk factors, what you value. And uh, just, I'm, I'm a big proponent of not making, I don't like to make hard and fast rules for other people but I like to try to inform as much as I can so that people can understand 
different risk factors based on the choices that they're making and mm-hmm. make an informed choice. Yeah. Okay. Can Can you take us through a one of your clients' kind of stories? Uh, in particular, I'm interested in a client who may have had some health issues. Um, you and then what you did, and then any sort of results that came out of that. Do you have anyone that comes to mind? Yeah. So we had a client, uh, we'll call her Sarah, just for uh, okay. uh, anonymity's sake. Yeah. Uh, and she came to us initially. She uh, was a referral from one of her uh, functional medicine doctors that she was being treated by. Uh, she was having long-term issues that the doctor thought would thought could be related to mold. Um, so she was having pretty severe breathing issues. Uh, she was very severely experiencing brain fog, um, wasn't able to work. Uh, it was causing severe strain on her marriage as well, wow. uh, because in a lot of cases, what we see, and this was no exception, uh, the wife is typically more sensitive mm. uh, to these issues and the husband who's less sensitive and may not be experiencing the same things, uh, it can very much begin to cause a lot of friction there. Right. Um, not understanding, especially whenever, yep. yep. Not understanding yep. the problem, especially whenever a lot of these issues are not as visible as what people expect them to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there was definitely a lot of friction there. Uh, we were called in, they were actually in the middle of, uh, finishing their basement as well. Uh, it was a relatively newer home unfin previously unfinished. Uh, they were in the middle of that process and, uh, we were called in. We came in, did some testing, did a visual assessment, and actually in the basement where uh, it was being finished, found some issues related to uh, memory serves. It was a leak that they had a year or two prior right. that they thought was cleaned up on the first floor and it looked like it probably was, but some of it had seeped through into the basement uh, and caused an issue that they didn't really know was there. Uh, combined with the process of actually having their basement finished, creating an excess of dust and from all the drywall dust Mm -hmm. and doing some of the cuts and stuff inside the home, just creating a lot of uh, additional particulate matter in the air and really creating a overall poor indoor air quality that was then exacerbating the mold exposure she was going through. Uh, So we were able to come out, we were able to uh, remediate the home. Uh, In that case, we did not just a full remediation on the basement, but we went through and did a full cleaning on the remainder of the home as well to make sure that we were capturing any spores that could have spread through other areas of the home uh, during the periods of exposure. And I mean, she's somebody that we still keep in contact with pretty regularly. uh, And it's really great because she's been doing so much better. The uh, brain fog was gone after about two months uh, post remediation, Uh, a lot of skin issues and things like that that she was experiencing through that were gone. Marriage definitely in a much better place because mm-hmm. uh, just having those issues resolved and not being sort of consumed by them uh, really just helped her mental health significantly as well. So it's it's really cool to be able to see that from our perspective and see that change that we're able to have. That's amazing. So so I understand your role better now, but what when you were talking then. You know, you're talking like with the the passion of, you know, medical doctor of like, you know, you mentioned research. What got you into this initially? Yeah. So uh, we were actually working in another uh, home service field and really kind of saw from the outside looking in that within the space of indoor air quality issues and particularly mold, there were kind of two camps of contractors that people were working with. It was either your large restoration companies that really weren't interested in the indoor air quality problems. They were interested in the big fire, water losses, those kind of things. Uh, And then on the other side, there were jack of all trades. So people that, yeah, they do some basement waterproofing, they'll do decks and also they'll do mold where they'll come over and spray it with bleach, scrub it and uh, maybe paint over it and kind of call it a day. Hmm. And there wasn't really anybody that was interested in the health effects that it was having that was really focused on the individuals and not just, okay, let's cover up the problem and make it look like it was never there. Mm -hmm. So we saw a huge opportunity there and particularly with people that are suffering from mold related issues uh, and mold related illness, there's, there was nobody 
that these people were able to turn to. I mean, uh, even adapting different protocols and processes. So like something we see commonly with clients that suffer from mold issues is uh, they can be chemically sensitive. So yes. when exposed to different types of chemicals, they may have a very strong reaction uh, that most people don't experience. And that's something we learned very early on. Uh, unlike most companies, we can't just have, this is the disinfectant that we use because some people react poorly to that. So went out of our way to make sure we're identifying what are the uh, safest disinfectants that we can use uh, and having a variety of them available. Mm -hmm. So that as we have clients with different needs, we're able to better match them with a product that works better for their individual sensitivities mm -hmm. um, or protocols for our technicians uh, and the fragrances. So making sure that they're not using uh, any sort of chemical fragrances, perfumes, de uh, uh, deodorants, those kind of things where they might be introducing uh, a new chemical odor into the home during the remediation process. That's Which the last thing we want to have. Trigger the client. Bingo. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So we're trying to just think through all those things. And really, I mean, I spend a lot of time on like internet forums with people who uh, are experiencing toxic mold issues and just trying to learn as much as I can about their experience mm -hmm. and figure out, okay, how could we as a remediator make that better for them? Wow. Okay. So, so you started mold medics and then it's a, you franchise it out. Is that correct? Yeah, so we just started franchising last year. Uh, okay. We currently have one franchisee in addition to our corporate territories here in Pittsburgh. Yeah, and uh, looking to continue to grow that way because I think it's, uh, I think what we're doing is really unique, and I think there's a need for more of it in a lot more markets. So mm -hmm. uh, definitely interested in seeing some additional growth there, so we can help more people. And other people who you follow doing the same thing. Uh, in other parts of America as well? There's a few different ones that we've came across over the years that uh, we definitely try to learn as much as we can yeah. from and take sort of bits and pieces of, okay, I like like this process that they describe. Um, in addition to just attending uh, as many different like online conferences and things as we can to learn about all of the different cutting edge things that are going on in the indoor air quality community. Yeah, okay. All right, so for, for my audience here, we've got... So your lifestyle is your medicine. People looking to um, change aspects of their lifestyle. So a lot of my clients will have their fitness dialed in, their nutrition dialed in, maybe even their mindset um, and sort of mental health dialed in, but maybe they're still struggling with something. So what should they look for in their home to sort of think, oh, this could be a mold problem? Yeah, so the, the first thing just kind of in general for uh, good environmental health, uh, it doesn't win me any friends saying this, but keeping a good, clean and orderly home, right. uh, keeping things clean and tidy. Uh, we see a ton of issues with overcrowded basements where they've got a bunch of stuff stored in crowd cardboard boxes uh, and they have a slight dampness issue or moisture intrusion issue from the outside. And those type of environments where they're not cleaned regularly, there's just a, a lot of clutter it creates an environment that's very conducive to not just mold growth, but other indoor air quality issues as mm -hmm. well. Pests and things like that, that can also contribute to uh, poor indoor air quality and then in turn, poor indoor health. So uh, keeping things just clean and tidy is definitely the biggest factor out of the gate because you'll prevent issues and you'll notice issues that come up a lot sooner. Uh, issues that go unaddressed for a long period of time are going to be harder to fix, they're going to be more problematic and they're going to impact your health more. So mm -hmm. uh, that's sort of the first thing out of the gate. And the second I would say is uh, just proper building maintenance is a big one. Uh, caulking around your exterior windows, making sure that your gutters and downspouts are cleaned and working and flowing properly. A lot of the things that uh, whenever a home's new, they're pretty dialed in, but then over time they can just break down and they need that sort of routine maintenance and a lot of times it's just kind of out of sight, out of mind. And yeah. these are the issues that if unaddressed can, can create problems fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so this, this, the tidy house, the routine maintenance, but what if, can people see the mold in their house or like what? In some cases for? for sure. Yeah. Yeah. In some cases they definitely can. Uh, the, a lot of times a, I mean, going through any dark areas of the home, um, 
and just looking for kind of issues, making sure if you see water, if you see any sort of leak or anything like that, going and taking the extra time to investigate where's it coming from, where's it going, uh, and really just kind of pulling that thread a little bit so you can find a potential issue is huge. Uh, but also monitoring the indoor environment, keeping an eye on your indoor humidity. Mm -hmm. That's probably one of the bigger ones where things can easily get out of whack is they don't have anything to monitor the humidity. They don't have like a dehumidifier to keep, keep the humidity in their home down. And you go through a period where it's particularly humid and it can very easily begin to cause an issue uh, where you have condensation reaching or condensation occurring on certain surfaces and mold growth start to occur. So uh, just really a lot of it's about more monitoring and prevention uh, than necessarily early detections big too, but it's going to be more situational as to where that's actually going to come in. But I want to sort of start wrapping up, but is there anything else that um, you, you've you noticed in your industry that you feel like is an important message to get across or have we touched on most things? Yeah. I mean, one thing I, I do like to talk about as much as I can on any of these is radon because radon right. is something that most people, yes. uh, especially where you are regionally, have very little to no idea about. Uh, and what is radon? And so radon is a naturally occurring gas. It's a it's radioactive. It comes from the breakdown of uranium in the Earth's crust. So basically the uranium's uh, going through radioactive decay, breaking down over time. That eventually through the process releases radon gas. Radon gas comes up through the soil and can begin to infiltrate our home through cracks in the foundation, through uh, joints, through drains, anywhere that basically air could get in. Uh, that radon gas is going to come in. And the problem with radon gas is it's colorless, it's odorless, uh, so you can't see it, you can't smell it, can't taste it. You have no way through our olfactory senses of detecting its presence. It can only be tested uh, and detected through some sort of laboratory analysis or uh, testing device. And radon exposure in the US in particular is the number two leading cause of lung cancer. So it's a significant issue. It uh, can also exacerbate other lung and breathing issues like exposure to mold. So a lot of this stuff can unfortunately work together. And uh, it's definitely very problematic, especially more so in some regions than, than others, but it can be a problem pretty much anywhere. So wow. um, it's something that's important for people to be aware of, to test for. And if they test uh, and find that their levels are elevated, uh, mitigation's pretty easily done. Oh, so. is it? I was going to say, what do you do for a gas that seeps into your house? What's the mitigation there? Yeah, so it's a, a process called subslab depressurization, which sounds very complicated, but at yeah. the end of the day, it's a PVC pipe goes down through the foundation and then gets uh, exhausted up above the roof line, and a fan's put on that pipe that keeps it under constant suction. Right. So basically, the the soil under your ho your home is under constant suction. So all that gas goes up that pipe and then gets exhausted safely up above your home where you're not breathing it in. Well, you kind of left that to last, but you know, radar <laughs> gas, that's not something um, I know much about. I, I vaguely remember my utilities company in Canada sent everyone a, 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 a sheet um, with a, with a diagram of where radon gas generally is more common in our area. Mm -hmm. and I thought that yep. was quite useful, but then I you know, I didn't know what to do about it, so I didn't do anything. But if yep. this causes causes lung cancer or, or can be linked to lung cancer, this is a, this is a big deal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a significant problem. And unfortunately, uh, so much of it is regionally based. And even in the United States, it is all over the place as to right. how different states regulate it, how much awareness there is behind it. Um, and, but it's definitely something that's very, very important for people to get your homes tested. It's super easy. I mean, this is one, uh, I'm not advocating for these guys specifically, mm -hmm. but this is just picked up at the big blue box store uh, and they're readily available for under $50. And it's a home um, test you just do yourself. Home test, you follow the instructions, go through it, seal it, send it into the lab. And then in a couple of days, they send you the results. Wow. Okay. Good. All right. You dropped a bombshell. Oh, hey, then anyway, I think you did. All right. So you got you got the toxic mold at all. It's a, it's a um pro associated problems and radon gas. 
And these yep. things need to be sorted to, to re realize optimal health for the humans. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And I, I'm a huge proponent of just making sure there's as much awareness around radon uh, and mold as there can be. Mold, I think gets a lot more, uh, at least in the health community, there's mm -hmm. starting to be a lot more awareness about mm -hmm. that. Whereas radon, that's the reason I like to tack it on to everything that I do and try yeah. to talk about it whenever I, whenever I can get a few seconds, because there's definitely not as much awareness on that front. No. Okay. All right. So how can people find out more about you and, and the services you offer? Yeah. So our website's moldmedics.com. Um, our franchising opportunities can be found on moldmedicsfranchising.com. Uh, and there you'll find a number of different articles talking about some of the different services that we offer. A lot of the different situations that we encounter, we've been really uh, pushing hard recently to try to create a lot more content, both blog posts, videos to try to help inform our client base in both in our markets and out of our markets as much as we possibly can. So yeah. uh, trying to make that a really good resource for uh, all of our clients. Yeah. I, I liked your website. It's not, it's not all about what you do. It's about the education for people to learn about what mold and radon actually, you do mention radon there. That can be a, can be a problem in the house. Yeah. 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 So, all right. Well, Tim, thank you very much. That was great. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate the time. No problems. Wow. That blew my mind because radon gas, I know he was talking about mold, but radon gas, I'd never thought of that one before. I remember reading about it years ago and, and thinking, oh, I should, I should learn more. And I never did. So you've got the toxic mold in the house can cause a whole host of uh, weird and wacky symptoms. And then you've got this, the silent, can't smell it, can't taste it, radon gas that could be seeping into your basement. Uh, obviously, geographically, it's different in different areas, but uh, well worth getting one of those tests uh, for 50 bucks or whatever he said to, to try that out. Hey, if you like this episode, don't forget to um, like and subscribe on any one of the podcast platforms that you are listening to this to. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, please like and subscribe. And also feel free to write a comment. If you want me to discuss a, a certain topic or you want me to interview a certain person, just let me know. Put those in the, in the comments there and I will do that. <laughs>